All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. My name is Naveen Swami. I'm a software developer at Amazon. Um, I work on deep learning framework and tools. Today, I'm going to talk to you about, briefly introduce you to deep learning, and then uh, the deep learning framework, Apache MXNet. And finally, the topic of today, the challenges involved in uh, running distributed inference and how we can uh, use MXNet and Spark together to, uh, 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 to solve this problem. So let's get started. Like you know, uh, machine learning is about using algorithms to learn patterns and make decisions. Uh, in traditional ML, uh, you had to go through a phase of feature extraction before you could do uh, before you could use the algorithm. This had some drawbacks, like you needed an expert, uh, expert in the domain to extract salient features in the data and tell the algorithm. Then it was error prone because it was handcrafted and uh, it did not work on new problems. Deep learning, uh, it works a little differently. The term deep learning and uh, neural networks are often used uh, interchangeably. Neural networks uh, originally was inspired by our uh, biological systems, uh, biological neural systems, the, how the learning happens on our brain. Today, it's become more of an engineering and uh, algorithmic challenge to, uh, to solve many different uh, ML tasks. Uh, deep learning learns important features for you uh, by itself through experience. It learns in terms of uh, hierarchy of concepts, building one concept at a time. Uh, so let's look at this uh, example network here, which is image classification. Given the image, it's trying to uh, it's trying to predict into one of the categories. So when you uh, you have a first layer to which you uh, to which you feed input la input pixels, and then you have uh, the first hidden layer. Uh, the layers in between input and output are called hidden because the values are not given by the data themselves. This is learned. Uh, by, uh, by the system uh, to, to explain the relationship. So the first layer is uh, here trying to understand edges in the image, and then the next uh, cor corners and contours. Then it's trying to understand object parts in the image. Finally, you have the output layer where it's trying to map uh, the input, uh, map your image into one of the predefined categories, giving you a probability score. If, the, if this network gets uh, very, uh, trained very well, you will get, uh, when you feed an image of dog, you'll get a very high uh, score on that. So uh, one thing to note here is that the word deep in deep learning doesn't mean it's uh, gaining a deeper understanding of the image. Uh, instead, it means that the number of layers uh, in, deep, in this neural network is really, really large. Deep learning uh, dates back to 1940s. So uh, in, uh, in the last five to 10 years, there were a few things that happened that changed the landscape of deep learning completely. The first one is uh, abundance of data. Uh, with, uh, with the digitization of our everyday life and uh, commoditization of IT resources like pro, uh, by providers like AWS, it's been never easy uh, to collect and analyze data. Now with uh, lots and lots of data, you can create uh, deeper networks. And then uh, the availability of high-performance compute. Here I mean GPUs. How many of you know the difference between CPUs and GPUs? OK. Uh, for others, <laughs> all right, for, uh, for, there are a few who did not raise their hand. So for others, uh, CPUs have fewer cores. Uh, giving you uh, f uh, only supporting only a fewer threads. On GPUs, you have hundreds of threads, hundreds of cores that can support uh, thousands of threads. This is especially important for deep learning because if you look deep down, these are linear algebraic operations that can be heavily parallelized. In 2009, researchers started using GPUs and suddenly they were able to use, uh, create models that were 10 to 20 times bigger and much faster. Finally, uh, this is a fast evolving field, so there are many advances, uh, in, and so uh, you, you get higher accuracy and faster learning. All of this gives us bigger and better models uh, with better AI products. We see it in personal assistance, translation apps, 
um, the autonomous vehicles, and then companies that are using deep learning in healthcare, this particular one helping the physicians to diagnose uh, heart, disease, heart diseases without the need for unnecessary uh, angiograms. Then you have AlphaGo Zero. This is a system that learned the world's greatest uh, intellectual game, Go, just by playing against itself without the need for any expert data. Just to uh, give you an idea of the complexity of this game, the possible number of configurations is more than the number of atoms in the, uh, in the universe. That's 10 to the power 80. And it ended up uh, winning against uh, the world's Go champion, KJ, uh, 100 to 0. One thing to note, without any panic, is that this system still had to go play millions of times before it could uh, master the game. But the players themselves played fewer games, and uh, they played instinctively. Now let's see where deep learning falls in this broad category of AI. AI was meant to focus on developing this cognitive capability of humans to reason and think. Um, many ML and non-ML uh, non methods have tried to do this. ML, uh, in the early days, tried to solve problems that were harder for humans, but easier for computers, and could be expressed as uh, ma formal mathematical rules. Today, deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, is trying to solve problems that are easier for humans to solve intuitively, but harder, for, harder to express them as formal rules. Whether deep learning is uh, leading to true AI is very debatable. And uh, what deep learning focuses today is a very small subset of what human intelligence is really capable of. I was reading an article by Michael Jordan. He's a computer science professor and statistician. Uh, his take on AI revolution was that uh, what we are trying to do today is actually build services uh, that helps uh, human intelligence and creativity. So he calls it intelligence augmentation, I IA, instead of AI. I think that's a very uh, good take. Despite all the progress and seeing uh, AI in, the, in our applications and impact on our life, there are a few limitations. One is the need for lots and lots of data and lots of computer, uh, compute power correspondingly. Though we have lots of data, getting exp uh, expert data is expensive, unreliable, and sometimes just not available. Then it cannot detect uh, inherent bias in data. Uh, imagine these decision-making systems being deployed at large scale. If it was trained on the data that had bias, it's a disaster awaiting. Finally, uh, Sometimes you just cannot explain why a model works better than the other. Uh, data scientists and research, sci research scientists say that the, uh, the art, there is an art, black art of uh, hyperparameter tuning in deep learning. So uh, hopefully you're convinced that deep learning is a big deal. Let's see how it works. Deep learning has two phases. Uh, deep learning uh, training where you develop a uh, model and feed lots of data to it. Uh, you check against the output to see if you got what you expected. Otherwise, you send it back. Let's look at this very, very dummy network, which has an input layer with two inputs and a, high, a hidden layer. Uh, between the layers, there are weights, and you, have a, and you have an output. You pass the data through the network. This is also called forward propagation or forward pass. And then you have an objective function, which is very simple here, y equal to 1.0. Uh, you, uh, you, you verify your, the output that you got against, against the ground truth and calculate loss and pass it back if it's not what you're expecting and take gradients on each of the weights to update them. This is also called backward propagation or backward pass. This is where the real learning happens. You do this many, many times. Uh, you would get, a, uh, to, until you uh, achieve your objective, you get a model. Then the next phase is putting this into uh, production, into uh, real use. Uh, this, is, uh, this is inference where you take the pre-trained model and apply new data and get predictions. This can be done in two modes, real time where, uh, for tasks that need immediate feedback, and then in batch mode where you have lots and lots of data. data. This is useful when pre-computations are necessary, 
for services that have uh, really low latency requirements, like recommender systems, which need to sort and rank amongst hundreds of user products, backfilling uh, your uh, inferences on historic data with state-of-the-art models you uh, develop today. Then testing new models before you deploy it to verify if it's yielding a better result. Let's look at a few types of learning that are popular. The first one is supervised learning, where you tell the computer program what's the semantic content contained in your data. Applications include image classification, speech recognition, and machine translation. Unsupervised learning, you have abundance of data. Now, this, uh, this type of learning is trying to uh, learn patterns from unlabeled data. Examples include clustering and association discovery. Then there is uh, the learning in between them, semi-supervised learning, which uses a human in the middle of the pipeline. It tries to uh, learn concepts from unlabeled data. When it's uncertain, it's going to query a user to get the labels and continue from there on. Then you have uh, re reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning, which is learning from experiences from the current environment using rewards and, uh, rewards and feedback. Uh, examples are in robotics. You look, uh, we looked at uh, deep learning. Next, look at, uh, next, let us look at Apache MXNet framework. The first question that you get is, why MXNet? How is it so different? Have all those reasons there? The first one is it offers APIs in many uh, programming languages uh, with simple syntax and supporting both imperative and uh, declarative style of programming. It, you can develop highly optimized models uh, for mobile and IoT. For training, we have seen that it's very highly performant, and uh, it achieves linear, linear scaling across hundreds of GPUs. Then it's an open source project currently incubating at Apache. Uh, the, the framework supports Onyx. How many of you know what Onyx is? OK. Uh, Onyx is an open source initiative driven by Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft to define an interoperable model format between uh, different deep learning frameworks. With Onyx support uh, in MXNet, you can bring models that are trained on other uh, uh, deep learning frameworks and run it on MXNet. Then there is Gluon API, uh, which is another open source initiative by Amazon and Microsoft to standardize deep learning APIs for ease of use, ease of understanding, and performance. MXNet not only implements these imperative APIs, it also, on the back end, optimizes for you to create a highly optimized symbolic graph. So now you can uh, quickly prototype uh, and not lose any uh, performance. Let's look at a few constructs uh, in uh, MXNet. The first one is NDRA. This is a, a multidimensional array construct that supports tensor operations that work on CPU and GPU. Um, tensors and multidimensional arrays are uh, used interchangeably. Then there are symbolic APIs. This is similar to NDRA, but it takes, uh, but it takes a declarative, declarative programming style for optimization. Let's look at one small example. Here, we have two operations c equal to b star a and d equal to c plus 1. Uh, on an, uh, if you use an ND array, the numerical computations happen as it encounters the statements. That is, when c equal to b star a, you get c and then d. In symbolic program, uh, you have to first create a graph and then compile it, uh, at which point in time, the backend will go and create, uh, uh, decompose the operators for you and uh, optimize the graph to remove any uh, redundant memory references, and also parallelize operations that are independent. Another uh, set of APIs is module. This, uh, this is a high-level API to work uh, with symbol. Here, you create a graph in symbol first. In this, uh, in this network, I have two a fully connected layer with the activation in between and a softmax layer. We feed it to the uh, uh, module and then bind this with the input data shapes for it to, now the engine will go and allocate memory for your uh, network. Finally, we pass data to either the fit routine, at, uh, which will train your network, 
or to the predictor to, in, to get predictions. Let's look at a small uh, demo. Here, uh, I'm importing MXNet. You can pip install MXNet. It's available on PyPy. I'm using a ResNet 18 uh, model. Uh, the MXNet, after training, uh, produces two files, symbol and parameter. Symbol contains the graph, and parameters the weights. If you look at the uh, model, it's a, it has a ResNet. Uh, it's a softmax, and then you have convolutions, activations, and pooling in between. And you have the data there, which you feed. And let's look at the parameters. You'll see there binary uh, data of, of, that has floating point values. Then you have a synset for uh, image classification like model. This gives you uh, the relationship between classes and uh, corresponding labels. Let's look at a quick, quick example uh, to run prediction. Here we have a small uh, image of a ship. It looks like that, and it's a three-dimensional array in ND array. We will feed that. You can also check the shape. We will feed that to the predict routine next to get um, Okay, we got uh, with six, almost 59%, it says it's a container ship. Not bad. Imagine this. Imagine if you have to do this on a very large data set. That requir requires uh, quite a few compute uh, power, and it has its own challenges. Let's look at what they are. Distributed inference has uh, some challenges. The first one being you need a highly performant DL framework. Uh, ju just to give you an idea, just a single forward pass uh, using an image on an image classification model like ResNet requires billions of floating point operations. So you need a framework or a library that's really efficient. And then you need a distributed cluster that's capable of managing your resources efficiently, uh, job tracking, scheduling, and efficiently uh, partition your data. Finally, you need a deep learning setup. Uh, sometimes it's non-trivial to set up the right set of libraries. For this use case, Amazon DL Army and Amazon EMR makes it a breeze to use. All of this sounds very familiar and similar to large-scale data processing uh, systems. Many of the uh, challenges here, Apache Spark already solves. It supports multiple cluster manager. Uh, it works very well with MXNet and also integrates with Hadoop and big data tools. So you can gain new insights into the data that you already have on Hadoop and big data platform. Let's see how we can leverage MXNet and Spark to achieve this. First, for this demo, I will be using uh, ImageNet trained ResNet 18 classifier. ImageNet is a project that runs annual competitions to, on various uh, visual recognition tasks. And in 2015, Microsoft researchers came up with this residual neural networks uh, um, model that was able to surpass human capability in this narrow subset of visual recognition tasks. So I'm using the 18-layer version of that uh, model. Even this needs about 3 billion floating point operations for a forward pass. Then for this demo, I will use Cipher 10. It's a publicly available uh, data set which has 10,000, I'll use the test data set with 10,000 images. I will be using PySpark for this demo on Amazon EMR. If you're a Scala programmer, uh, MXNet is also available in Scala. Finally, this, inference, uh, this demo is on CPUs, but you can easily extend it to GPUs when you have lots of data. Let's look at the pipeline itself. For the demo, I have all the images on S3. Uh, you can put it uh, in HDFS or any other that works. Then we, I, create a RDD, uh, I create a RDD of this S3 keys. We don't need to pass around the uh, images between driver and executor. Um, and partition this across the cluster. We fetch a batch of images on the executor. Uh, the reason is, like I said, you can uh, heavily parallelize, and a batch size of more than one is just another dimension in the tensor. We can parallelize that well. We'll convert it into a NumPy array and then feed it to the library, uh, run predictions. All of this happens inside of a Spark map partitions method because we want to run it on a batch. 
Another thing to note is that we'll initialize the model only once. There is a latency uh, cost to it if you do it with every map partition. Finally, we collect the, uh, collect the predictions. Let's look at some code. Here, I'm setting the number of uh, executor cores to one. By default, Spark creates one task per core, but uh, MXNet can uh, efficiently use all CPUs. So I'll just set one task uh, per executor and let MXNet handle all the CPU. Another thing to note here is that uh, uh, we are using map partitions, and also the number of partitions is based on the number of keys and the number of images that you have, uh, number of keys and um, the batch size that you determine by experiment based on the memory and uh, CPU you had. Another thing to note on the executor is that we want to, like I said, uh, load only once. So we'll use uh, singleton and uh, static methods to uh, initialize only once. Initial, also, import the library at the, uh, at the map partition level, uh, map partition method, and make them available on all the nodes. Otherwise, what happens is PySpark starts serializing if you put it at the top of the module, and most often fails saying that it can't understand pointer references. Let's look at this small demo. Here I have a, a Amazon EMR cluster. I have a, a M3 Excel as a master and C48 Excel. And uh, I have some sample code on a blog post that I wrote. Yeah, you can use that. Also, uh, today, uh, uh, also Amazon SageMaker already supports Spark. You should check out if you want to see. Uh, this already exists. So let's run this. Here, I'm disabling a dynamic allocation. I don't want the executors to compete for CPUs and uh, memory, but you're free to uh, experiment and see what works for you based on the instance type. Let's run this. So uh, at the end, the uh, program optionally can uh, write to a S3 uh, bucket if you give it a S3 bu bucket and a key. I set the batch size to 64 based on some experiments that I did on the particular instance type that I chose. It was more, uh, mostly memory intensive than CPU intensive. So yeah, it's getting accepted. So let's look at it in the resource manager. All right. There you go. Okay, it started running, and we'll see that the model gets loaded once, and it'll start executing on a batch or a partition of uh, images. And here, uh, the prediction is: uh, I'm taking the top five probabilities of the pre uh, uh, from the uh, th uh, thousand uh, labels that it thousand probabilities that it gets. So here is the output. So let's look at the job that's already done. OK. Yeah, this job was uh, it completed in uh, 3.9 minutes. There were 165 tasks and with 64 each. Uh, that was pretty fast. Uh, to summarize. I briefly talked about deep learning, uh, why it's a big deal, the phase of deep learning and types of deep learning. Then uh, MXNet, it's a very uh, efficient deep learning library. Check it out. And then uh, how to leverage MXNet and Spark for distributed inference. We just released uh, simplified Scala inference APIs. Uh, it's available on Maven if you are a Scala programmer. Check it out. We are working on Java APIs. We have heard from users that uh, though data scientists prefer Python, uh, people who productionize uh, engineers, um, are, uh, they prefer a type language. So we are uh, coming up with a simplified version of uh, APIs for inference in mind. 
And then we are considering to add data frame support. Uh, finally, MXNet is a fast evolving uh, community. I invite you all to join uh, our mailing list, dev at mxnet.apache.org, and have your uh, use cases heard so we can, so the community can prioritize. And also, if the code is available on GitHub, deep learning is an exciting field. Go check it out and uh, join hands to democratize AI. A few resources here. Uh, one of them is Gluon Tutorials. This offers, uh, starting from the basics, you can learn about deep learning all the way to implementing the object detection paper SSD. And if you want to get a deeper understanding of uh, deep learning, then there is deep learning book by Yashio Benjio and others. Yeah. Our uh, GitHub repo is Apache slash incubator MXNet. And thank you for listening to me. If you have questions, I'll take. We have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, please use the mics. I'll be out there if you want to, uh, if you have questions or uh, want to chat more. Oh, all right. OK, you have a question. Quick question. Thanks for the talk. So uh, I'm not familiar with MXNet, and you talked briefly about how do we use it with Apache Spark. I was just wondering, like, uh, if I, I mean, what is the difference? What uh, does MXNet provide better if I, for, uh, com I mean, for example, use TensorFlow with Apache Spark? Uh, Good question. This is a incubating project at uh, Apache. So uh, one of the one of the good things is you can join hands and uh, you know contribute to the cause. And also we are trying to uh, we are very user focused. So we're trying to solve problems uh, that users are coming uh, coming uh, coming to us with. Uh, we started supporting imperative APIs through Gluon. So now you can quickly prototype. And also uh, in the back end, like I said. Uh, the uh, engine will optimize and create a, uh, very, uh, create a symbolic graph. So if you're a data scientist, you would use uh, imperative APIs. And uh, if you're a, a production, if you're an engineer, you can get this uh, highly optimized symbolic graph and just deploy without losing any performance. Yeah. And also we are supporting like Onyx, I told you. Uh, it's a, you, you can bring models from other, uh, other frameworks and also we are working on export. So if you used MXNet, you can also go uh, use other frameworks. You're not, you know, you're not stuck to one framework. Thanks. Thanks, Naveen.